Okay, here's what I think is the little known secret to success of anything you want to do in life, whether it's starting a business or starting a new career or anything. Yeah, because it's so hard to do anything, right? And, and, and your chance of failure is a lot. You know, like I've written over 100 books in my life and only 10 you know, have been made any money at all. So I'm even wrong 90% of the time and I miss doing this a long time. So when you're choosing a business, what should I do when you use your intellectual capabilities to try to figure out the best thing in life and you know, the best business to start or whatever. And I think the bottom line is really all about having fun. Because, here's why. Okay, if you choose something that you think is so much fun, <laughs> number one, you're going to get through the tough times. You know, because everything you're going to choose really is going to be a pain in the butt. I mean, that's what life is. You know, one problem after another and getting through it and whatever. So if you're there just for like money or, or you know, prestige and stuff like that, you know, you'll you quickly see something else maybe that will get you there faster. And you won't get through the hard part that it takes you know, to get through and to be a success with your business or new career or whatever you want to do. And that's why if you're if you think you're having fun doing it, this is something you want to do more than anything else in the world because you want to have fun. <laughs> and then so many people think, well, what's the smartest thing to do? And sure, you want to use your head, but you want to use your heart too. And if you're having fun, man, now just think of it. Okay, so you take you know a couple of years to do something or whatever. And, 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 and it's effort, but you're having fun doing it, right? So every day is fun. So whether you, <laughs> at the end of the process, whether your idea or job or whatever is successful or not, you already had a lot of fun, you know? <laughs> and so you, you cut out the middleman by having fun first instead of waiting for the end. <laughs> and that's the smart thing. And, and, and to me, what, what is really needed I mean, I learned this the hard way. I mean, I went to MBA school, you know, and they taught me how to do businesses and how to be smart about it and spreadsheets and all this kind of stuff. And, and actually, my first two businesses failed. I got an MBA in computers and I even had a software company back in the 70s that went down the toilet. <laughs> and after I saw my two businesses that failed, I said, gosh, you know what? I didn't have any fun doing those businesses because I was doing things that, you know, I was told to do or things that I thought other people said I should do and taking everybody's advice and I wasn't having fun. I wasn't following my heart about it. And then when I started having fun, then it was different. It was unique. I lend something very special to what I was doing. This is where the question mark suits came from. After that, and I saw, then that business was a success because I was different. I was starting to have fun. And people saw that. And then that attracts people to you, you know, because you're having more fun than everybody else. <laughs> everybody else is out there working and you're having fun working. <laughs> now, how great is that? See, nothing could be better than that to me. So you're having fun and that's why then to be all of life was how could I have more fun and I get trapped every once in a while because I had a little success and then somebody tells you oh let's go how to be more successful and you do this and do that and then I said well God, all you know, old question mark suits that was in me that's something I thought was going to be fun to do everybody told me no and even when I first wore the question mark suits they they I lost millions of dollars they they threw me off television they wouldn't have me because oh you have to be serious and talk about your serious stuff and and I was even on a big home shopping network and had millions of dollars from that thing and they said you can't go on the air like that you know we're a serious business and I had to give that up because this is something that was important to me something I always really want to do this is having fun and this suit changed my life man people took me better than everybody I, I opened more doors in my life after this happened and I made more money than ever by giving up that million and that was because I think listen to my heart and having fun so I think when you're out there trying to think what to do in life, is think about the fun. What is fun for you? Because life is such a struggle, I think. You know, we all have to struggle through this. So if you find a way to struggle by having fun, ah, <laughs> it's sort of like beating the system, isn't it? 
Hi, I just came back from Shanghai, China, right? <laughs> it was a dream, but it really was a vacation. I don't like to do vacations, but it's a dream opportunity. You know, and I spent 10 days there actually with my son, who is a 30 year old IT guy. And uh, we were looking for people to do apps. Cause I think, you know, what, uh, what's happened to me in the last, you know, 10 or so years is that nobody buys books anymore. So I have to take my information and find new ways to do it. I've been really struggling with that because people don't know how to sell information anymore in this country. I mean, look at the Washington Post is going out of business, bookstores are gone and everything. So I got to figure out this other thing and it's been a struggle and how to do it. So I wanted to go someplace to expand my mind and I've been taking Mandarin lessons for the last two years. I know like five words, <laughs> but actually I got a grant from the Chinese government to take them in local universities and we've done videos on these before, you know, how you could go to local university and take Mandarin classes from people who teach China from China. They teach Chinese, you know, and, and they're wonderful. It's only like $100. The regular course is $3,000 in university and these they give, you know, like for a hundred bucks. So it's like getting a grant from China. So I uh, finally got over there and it's an exciting city, man, especially for entrepreneurs. Man, this is a fun city and it's growing like gangbusters and uh, everybody there doesn't even worry about what's going on in, <laughs> in their government like people here you know, or what's going on in Hong Kong and everything. They're just having fun in this city and building businesses and whatever. And, and there's like 28 million people in that city, 28 million. I mean, New York City has like 10 or something like that. So this is a huge, one of the biggest cities. Like but it doesn't feel crowded. You go to New York City, you feel jammed and people are, man, there's just so much space and you don't see a lot of people. There's no crowds and things like that, you know, to speak of. And that was so amazing to me. You know, other things are amazing. Uh, I'll let you know, but before I talk about, you know, why it's important for entrepreneurs, uh, but it, you don't even have to know how to speak Mandarin. I've been struggling with my 10 Mandarin words for years now now when I get there and I, I'm actually taking classes there every day. My you know, take classes like that there. Uh, and uh, uh, and I go into like Starbucks. By, by the way, Starbucks is everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> there's almost a Starbucks within the Starbucks, you know, restroom. And they're bigger there. And, and I'm struggling with my five words in Mandarin trying to order Starbucks. And the guy behind the Starbucks counter said, Hey, hey, speak English. What do you want? <laughs> He's yelling at me. <laughs> speak English. You know, you think that when you go to a foreign country, you want, <laughs> you want to respect the language and culture, so you at least try, and that would be respected. No, nah, they want you to speak English. Most of the young people, everybody, you know, so many people speak English there, so that was fun. And, and, and there's so many expatriates living there, people from America, uh, <coughs> Uh, from India, from France, or all over Israel, you know, and they all seem to love it there. I mean, you know, and now actually they just changed the rules, you know, uh, where you could stay for 10 years. Actually, you could stay for 10 years, but you have to renew your, your papers every year. Now you one time stand for 10 years, they, they forget about you for 10 years. So people love it. And the people with families that are there, I mean, even I talk to Americans that uh, are there. I mean, they say the only thing that is bad that they may come back is pollution and the school system. Yeah. Other than that, what's going on in, in Beijing and the government, they don't even care. They're having so much fun in Shanghai. Uh, and, and also it's a safe city. Man, the police, nobody has guns. No policeman has guns. <laughs> and you feel safe. Well, you, you never hear or read about shootings in the mall and things like that. No, nobody has guns and the policemen are walking around macho stuff, you know, and hey, well, you better watch it, pisser. You know, I hear you, you, you sometimes have a feeling of, of tightening up when you see a policeman. If you're doing something wrong just because you're alive, there's the opposite, you know. The policemen don't have that much power. I mean, they do, but it's nobody's fear. There's not fear living in, in, in there. Uh, and that was sort of a pleasant surprise. And, and even the men seem to be less macho. I mean, here, if you're a guy in the United States, you got this little job as macho. Everybody's playing, you know, uh, tackle football and everything they do, you know, ah, you know, they treat each other that way. They're, they're softer guys, you know, and that seems to be a lot less energy involved in living there, at least for me. I found this in India too. You know, I was there for a couple of weeks and, and, and I had more 
energy in Shanghai. And I think one of the reasons is that macho thing is not there. I mean, I lived, I got off the plane after a 20 some hour flight and hardly slept on the plane and only slept for five hours a night for two weeks almost, 10 days, you know, and still had energy. I got home now, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sleeping more than I'm awake now for a few days. Uh, but that's kind of energies out there. People are starting businesses. There's so much money there. You know, uh, I gave speeches at clubs, uh, venture capital meetings, you know, entrepreneurs, startups and everything all over the, and what surprised me is they liked what I had to say about how to start businesses, how to get money and everything. I mean, this is halfway across the world. Yeah. <laughs> and even the philosophy there, I, I run into even Chinese people who, who are more concerned about not just making money. And I, I, you know, maybe I don't understand. Maybe they haven't been entrepreneuring for a long time. And we've been, you know, a capitalist society for a long time. We take it natural and they seem to be a little more tuned in about the other things in life. I mean, if they, you know, uh, talking to people, I'm making, and they're not as happy, you know, and, and they're trying to do something about it. So when I talk about following your passion or, or having fun in life and things like that, boy, they were grabbing on that kind of information. And these are, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of people that I talked with in public forums and everything that really surprised me uh, how, how they appreciated it and even appreciated, you know, the, the, the free money stuff that I talk about too. So, <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm more appreciated in China than in here, but I'm trying to help people here. You know, that was a wonderful experience, you know. Uh, and, uh, gosh, I, I, you know, everyone can't afford to do this and everything, but it, it, it is an amazing country over there uh, and people should know about it. And if you're an entrepreneur, man, I would get over there because there's so many venture capital people looking for deals. I talked to so many uh, entrepreneur, iTech entrepreneurs, they just go from deal to deal and they think of a company, they think of an app, they work on it, they get venture capital money, start the next one or whatever. And some other neat things about the country, you don't even need a car. Man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the subway system is so cool, it's so clean. See, nothing's like more than 10 years old over there <laughs> because it's just a brand new city. It's huge, it's sparkling, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, exciting. You know, there's excitement everywhere. And taxis are cheap too, even for you, but you don't even need a taxi. That's the only time I felt that maybe you need to speak Chinese because the people in taxis, driving taxis were the only people that probably did no English, it seemed to me. Everybody else did. And it's clean. People are sweeping leaves off the street and off the sidewalk every hour, it seems. Uh, it's just an exciting kind of place. Shopping, man, they're the biggest shopping malls I ever see. I mean, we went to one that was, you know, like a, a football stadium size, but like 10 football stadiums, six floors high hugest thing I've ever seen in my life. And downtown, I mean, this is sort of like out in the suburb, and you get there very easy with the subway, and for a dollar. <laughs> it's wonderful. And even in town, there's so much luxury stores. There are luxury stores, seven floors of the most luxurious stores you've ever seen, you know, uh, and huge. And then seven blocks later, there's another big uh, uh, corral of, of luxury stores, a luxury market. I mean, yeah, Shanghai or China itself is the largest luxury market in the world now. You know, but in between all that are hundreds, dozens, even thousands of little shops on specialty goods. I mean, I look at those little shops, you know, and I'm a clothes horse, so I look at those uh, shops of clothes and man, they're neat. And they're little, little, little you know, walk-in stores somewhere, but that coolest, neatest clothes that you've ever seen. People are polite. They're not as friendly and open outwardly. You have to get to know them a little bit first before they show any emotion. <laughs> but it, it, it's all, and it's coffee shops all over. I mean, it, you could stay and you don't feel like here sometimes, I work a lot in coffee shops and I feel, oh, I've been here a little too long and I feel, I don't know. There, some of them are so big, you don't, you're not intimidated by anything. Terrific coffee, you know, and a terrific place to hang out. Starbucks even has, huge, you know, 
places. I mean, the, the downstairs is very small, but then you go upstairs, they're a huge place to hang around all day. You know? And again, as I said, Starbucks is everywhere. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, and the women there, you know, are, are uh, dress sexy and they're cute and things like that. So that uh, all this kind of eye candy kind of stuff in, this, in the street. And seniors, they take over every park. In the morning, you'll see seniors exercising in groups and solo, and they have music, and they're playing badminton. They play badminton when I'm a net, and they're slamming the, the the bird back to each other, like playing fastball catch. But there's a badminton rackets, and old people, little old ladies, whacking that ball back and forth. You know, uh, we don't have joggers running around like what they they. I mean, we, they don't have it like we do here, but the the. the parks are just full of seniors that are exercising so they're not walking around in wheelchairs or in a nursing home with no fresh air they're out there doing the tai chi and the dancing uh or whatever and and another interesting thing i i felt was using what's called the you know the airbnb we've done things in this uh before instead of a hotel and that really caused my experience to be the best experience in the world. I mean, if I went to a hotel, sure, it'd be nice, and there'd be a concierge or whatever and things like that. But Airbnb, I mean, the people, when I read the reviews before I chose a place, uh, I found a place that the, the people who have this Airbnb, this is like somebody's private home that you're using, or it's an apartment or things like that, um, that it, it tells you what they really have done for people. Everybody leaves reviews about everybody else. So I see how they help these people. So gosh, I felt I need help when I get there and I don't want some fancy hotel to give me help, you know, for some list of places. I want personal help with people are, who live in the cities and, and the owner of the Airbnb is really an American uh, who married a Chinese guy and, and so she, she knew and actually that's what happened. She hooked me up when I got there to this um, it was a meeting going on at NYU, you know, the university has a campus over there and they were using, they were having a startup, uh, like festival, a, a meetup on Saturday morning. I went there and they asked me to speak and I met so many contacts there and spent the rest of the week, you know, doing meetings from the contacts I met there. And then I was invited to, invited to another startup place, you know, and, and gave a speech there. And, that's why I couldn't get this at a fancy hotel. And, you know, I was living right on the street practically in a little alley off the shopping district in the main part of town. So I felt like a native living there. And the neighbors there started waving to me and, you know, uh, uh, Xiao uh, Xiang Hao <laughs> in the morning. That's good morning if you don't know Mandarin. Yeah. And things like that. And that's why it's a wonderful opportunity to travel, to use these, because you're not traveling as a tourist as much. And, and, and these people there, that's how they get business, how much they could help you personally. You know, and, and that's what you, we need. I mean, it's like visiting a friend almost, but you, <laughs> you don't have to be that polite if you don't want to. You know? uh, and then also after what's neat about these Airbnbs, like now she gave a review of me and I gave a review of her and it just popped up on Airbnb. So that means idiots who go in trash rooms and hotels and everything like that, you know, look at cop, you can't be an idiot, you know? <laughs> so that's why you use something and use, I know that person, I cleaned up the room like I never cleaned up any room in a hotel room because this felt like I was staying at a friend's house, you know, and it's just a different experience. And I think that's why people say the internet and, and having computer screens are, are, are making us more remote from people. No, I think they're making us closer to people. Look, now I'm able to go to Shanghai and feel like <laughs> I'm staying with a friend. <laughs> and they treat me like a friend. And they're showing me special things to do in the city that I couldn't get anywhere else. So that's how I spent my summer vacation, but it wasn't summer, it was November. <laughs> and I had the greatest time of my life. I got so excited about what to do for the rest of my life and uh, by getting input from somewhere else because you don't know where good ideas are from. And I didn't know what was gonna happen in Shanghai. All I know that I've been frustrated here in the States trying to think exactly what to do and getting out of my environment and getting new input and everything shook something loose that made things settle that now I have just more energy than ever 
and just can't wait to start doing it. So do something in life. That's the key. Even though if you don't know what's going to happen, as long as you keep doing something happens. Now, I don't know if you've been following the news lately, but you still got to worry about your mortgage. You know, I mean, now, last year, there were almost, what, 700,000 foreclosures. You know, and what's happening, the mortgage companies and the banks are still screwing over people. I mean, doing shenanigans, you know, that makes you lose your house. So you really got to be careful. Uh, the, the people in New York, the regulators, have the one of the biggest mortgage companies in the country you know, is now under thorough investigation for screwing over people. Actually, what they had is one of the stories in the uh, they're talking about, I mean, the, the, you know, this woman who had a home for like 12 years, they paid like $100,000, and then they start sending her letters that she, oh, she missed this, or they, you know, there was some kind of extra fee they forgot about, and this extra fee wound up to be like $80,000, you know, more than the money she owed, and then now they're taking her to court for $150,000, and the mortgage that is already 10 years old is only like $98,000. So, I mean, it, it, it is a nightmare. And so if you're worried about your home or mortgage or anything, make sure you get help. And you don't get help on the internet or scams or uh, people like that, that you go to get real, real help. And what happened is that the government has now offices for prof at professionals. See, what the government's doing is paying professional people that know the system to help you for free. So don't go on the internet trying to hire somebody to help you with your you know, mortgage problem or whatever it is. You can't pay your bills or you maybe foreclose. On. No, there's free stuff. If you go to uh, HUD, you know, HUD, just Google HUD and then foreclosure avoidance counseling. Foreclosure Blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean. Foreclosure Avoidance Counseling and HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development. And make sure anything you click on, make sure it's .gov and it's not .com or anything. And actually, you'll, you'll see that you can just click on your state and you'll see the names, addresses, and phone numbers of people you can call and get real help over the phone or in person or whatever about your mortgage and any problem you have with it. Uh, because there's so many scams out there. And actually, you want to know about the scams, you know, go to something called a uh, US USA.gov, USA.gov, and on that website, if you search foreclosure resources, and you'll see all the foreclosure scams. You know, maybe you've even heard about them some already because they're sort of interesting. Like the the lease back and rent to buy scams. This is where you're asked to transfer the title of your home temporarily now we'll give it back to you honest you know and it's, it's stupid and, and they wind up with your home and you wind up with nothing so don't do that another one is fake government modification program so people will contact you and they say oh yeah we have these modification we'll help you with a mortgage and everything and you just have to pay this fee and everything Government programs don't require a fee. So anybody who's calling you up and say, hey, they get, you know, Obama put in this law and we're gonna help you, but you just give us money. You know, that's nonsense, don't do that. Or refinance fraud. This is where scam artist offers to be the middleman between you and your mortgage lender. And of course, they're gonna want some money from you to do all that work for you. <laughs> no, <laughs> the the counselors that I gave you that they, uh, you know, the free help, they'll do the same thing for free. And they know the rules and they're only there to help you. They're not there to make extra money. They're not making a buck from you at all. So they're not there to find out how to get more money from you. They're just there to help solve your problem. Or, or the other scam is eliminate your debt scam, you know? And they say, oh, people don't know about these special hidden laws, you know, that they'll wipe out all your debt, you know? As long as you give them money. <laughs> Nonsense, you know, forget all this stuff. That's why the internet is, is filled with traps because anybody with a nickel can, you know, put up a website and say they're official or not official or they're, they're some guy, you know, in their basement just trying to cut money out of you. Uh, same with refinance scams, you know, uh, and they encourage you to, you know, they call it the foreclosure rescue, you know. That's all nonsense. Yeah, you know, uh, don't uh, you know? Deal with any of these kind of people. Go to that free service first. Uh, and and here's what to beware of any kind of scam. Okay, one is beware of anyone who asks you to pay for a fee in exchange for a counseling service or modification of a delinquished loan. So fee. Anybody you know, saying, hey, all you have to do is pay this little fee. You know, where it's five hundred, five thousand, whatever. <laughs> 
you're out of there. Don't even listen to anybody anyway until you uh, do these free sources. Okay, scam artists often ta target homeowners who are struggling to meet their mortgage commitment and anxious to sell their homes recognize and avoid these common ones so if you're anxious man they know to you they see a scam artist will come up and they know you have a problem and they'll paint a picture like they're the white guy the horse the guy, well, what am i talking about <laughs> the the knight on the white uh, horse you know coming to the rescue and they make you feel good and they're going to get your money or your house or both okay and beware of people that pressure you to sh sign papers immediately but i can't even talk today i don't know what's going on <laughs> or to try to convince you that they can save your home if you just transfer the deed to them <laughs> they're gonna save you no they're gonna rip you off okay do not sign over the deed to your property or to any organization and individual unless you are working directly with your mortgage company because they're the people that's going to take you to jail or take their power over anything so all the middlemen don't really have power but so know the laws know the facts you know go to that website get the help it's all free you know the government's paying for it you're paying for it anyway just go to google and and uh, put in foreclosure avoidance counseling it's free you know i don't even know all this stuff who can you know and the people that are on the internet that you're googling for they know how to get your money that's what they know the best so first get the people who know how to fix your problem and they'll do it for free You know, if you know where to look for government data, it could stop you from like maybe starting the worst businesses in the world. <laughs> and actually some of these are franchise businesses. See, there's people out there spend a lot of money trying to get young entrepreneurs to buy franchises. You know, they're guaranteed success and you know, they have all kinds of ways to make you believe that this is the best thing to do in life. You know, uh, particularly if you're looking for something to do by yourself, you know, uh, and quit your day job or whatever yeah and, and they spend so much money i've gone to franchise conventions where you know it, it's like rock stars you know that they spend money on this kind of stuff so you've got to be careful and see what's neat about government data <laughs> you could find out who the good franchises really are because you can't believe a salesman right somebody's selling you something even me you know you're just so biased and their job is to get money from you and they spend 24 hours a day trying to think about that but see because most franchise people get money from the government they get loans from the government so you could go to the Small Business Administration and find out <laughs> who defaulted on their loans. And there was a big article in the New York Times recently about the big uh, you know, offenders of this, you know, and like Planet Beach. I don't know if you know about that franchise. That's one of these tanning salons. Man, almost 40% of those people go out of business. They're, they defaulted on their government loans. You know, Huntington Learning Centers. And you'd think that, boy, this is a big booming. Everybody wants their kids to be Einstein, you know, and to compete for a good college and all that kind of stuff. So they have a 30%. That means, you know, almost a third of those businesses that start, you know, go out of business. And they're supposed to be <laughs> the guarantee guaranteed successful businesses because they've tried it they worked out all the key quiznos you've seen them around right <laughs> you know they have a 30 percent you know uh, failure rate too cold stone creamy creamery you know they're pretty good ice cream you know i've used those guys look at most of the people you know not most but you know 30 percent of the people going out of business amico transmissions me <laughs> me those people you know uh, minuteman press sylvan learning centers I mean, and this is all from government data that you could use. So you got to be careful. They're salesmen, and you could get the facts and make important decisions by knowing where that data are. See, data is plural. You can't say data is; it's data are. <laughs> and uh, here's another article from the Bloomberg Business: How 1.5 billion dollars in franchise loan program. So much money is given. See, there's over like uh, three quarters of a million franchises out there. So it's a a lot of ways people think hey this is a good way to make money it's easy i don't have to think but man you become a slave in my mind to the franchise people but <laughs> that's another story time for another topic there's another database that you should be
beware, but uh, Blue Mau Mau, you know, and they have the same data, but it shows a little different information, like Wings and Things has a 90% failure rate. I've seen those restaurants around, you know, just a buck. I'm not even sure what they are. Executive Tans, you know, they have failure rates of 80%. I mean, that's amazing. Actually, this is public data, uh, and we're gonna have a new website called, you know, that, that's gonna have less go public data, you know, that you could look at things like this and not go through the drudgery uh, of trying to get, you know, this information from the government and put on your own database and everything. And we'll show you how to get that data if you wanna do that. So that's another thing. And see, if you get caught up with any kind of franchise or anything, because if you're looking for a business opportunity, that's what usually you run into. And these people are very slick you know, in doing that. Now, every franchise has to follow the rules of the Federal Trade Commission. So if you have anybody that's selling you something on a franchise or you bought one and, and you know, they don't think you got a square deal, well, you complain the Federal Trade Commission and you go to their, their website, ftccomplaintassistant.gov, and you'll see there that they have a special thing under their complaint thing for franchises, right? So they you know, they get a lot of problems so there's a lot of problems with these kind of businesses and also before you make a decision about a franchise you know they have to disclose a lot of public information at the state level not at the federal level, but at the state level. And there's about 15 states that require this. So even if you're not in that state, you could go to one of these 15 states and and as for the disclosure information, see this is this is not their advertising. See, advertising, you know, they could fudge and lie and things like that. Who's going to <laughs> stop them? But on a government document, you know, they sign that and says they go to jail if they lie. So the information they put on those government documents are going to be uh, more detailed, more fair <laughs> than what you're going to get in some promotional brochure. And all those states are listed here on that uh, uh, screen you can see there. And, or you could just search franchise disclosure and you'll see what states have it in or put those one of those 15 states in there. Contact that office and they'll send you that if they charge a, you know, $10 copying fee or probably for free to send out. So you get information. See, that's what's so neat about government information when you're doing it. People that lie, you know, like Dun & Bradstreet. I used to lie to Dun & Bradstreet all the time that collect financial information on businesses because I know the only people that are gonna get that information are my competitors. You're not gonna call Dun & Bradstreet when you deal with me or whatever. So I used to lie. But when I fill out a government form, Man, I don't like because on the bottom says when I sign that it says I go to jail or something bad's gonna happen in my life, <laughs> and that keeps me awake and honest too. So that's why this government data is so important, and, and it could help you make important decisions in life. You know, particularly <laughs> you know, starting a business or getting a loan for a business. Who failed at that before? You want to know that, and that's how you can find out. Okay, now there's 15 to 20 million people out there, you know, people like you that only have three months to collect up like the seven, eight thousand dollars a year every year. And listen, your income could be anywhere from zero to almost ninety thousand dollars a year. <laughs> That's right. And the deadline date now for this year, or you have to wait next year, is February 15th. You know, and actually, it's to pay for your health insurance. That's what's going on. They opened up the, uh, you know, the time now that you could uh, apply for Obamacare. <laughs> well, that's health insurance. That's not Obamacare. That's keeping you alive. You know, and there's so many things in there that people don't realize. And the people that, you know, aren't covered yet, you know, these 15 million people that, that uh, there's more than that that aren't covered, but they're what they expect, you know, to, to apply this year. And, you know, 50% of those people have no idea that they could get grants to help pay for it. You know, 90% of the people don't even know it's the enrollment period. So tell your friends, tell, you know, people don't have insurance yet, uh, health insurance, tell them about it. Or uh, two thirds of the people, like 67%, don't know anything about the marketplace out there. So it's a one-stop thing, you know, and actually it just opened up like last week, you know, and, and here's the story. It's like, here's a Los Angeles furniture store worker who never had health insurance before, and he found a plan that cost him $75 a month, okay, for that covers him and his son, okay, an unemployed accountant down in North Carolina, 
you know, who tried and failed to sign up last year, I guess because it was so screwed up or whatever, it was difficult, found coverage this year for $11.75 a month. $11, she's covered, you yeah. know. Or a self-employed house contractor in West Palm Beach found a plan that cost them nothing, zip. Zero, nada. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why right. you, know, you have until the 15th of February to sign up. Uh, now, if you want coverage by January 1, that's uh, like the probably the uh, soon as you get coverage, you have to apply by December 15th. Okay, so that's to apply by 7 15th. Uh, to get coverage on January 1. Uh, otherwise, you have until February 15th to start getting coverage. <laughs> and there were 7 million people last year who got coverage. So, I mean, that's everybody complains about Obamacare and, you know, that's most political stuff. I mean, most important thing is that people get care. You know, there, there, there's, you know, we live in the richest country in the world and we have 50 million people that didn't have insurance. And this is plugging away. We got seven to 10 million people. You see a lot of different data. You know, on last year they got it, there'll probably be another amount this year. And that people get coverage. Because when you don't have coverage, you don't take care of yourself. You wait, you know, and put off going to the doctor and, and that won't be uh, the problem anymore. And this year, there's actually more choice plans. So you have more choices to make. There's more insurance companies offering their plans because they you know, it's a deal for insurance companies. They, you know, the government is paying <laughs> for you to have, you know, insured. Say before the insurance companies only wanted good people who weren't sick because that's how they made money. So sick people and people really needed insurance and they charge outrageous fees. So they can't do that anymore. You know, that ball game's over. But now what they're doing to placate the insurance company, giving them money for the other people, you know. Uh, and actually the premiums are actually declining this year. And it depends on where you live and there's all kinds of funny things that, you know, is a complicated system. Uh, all right. And if you have insurance from last year, what they're saying now, it go back on the exchanges because you could probably get a, a better deal. There's a lot of people looking now because there's more programs, more plans that suit you better and, and you'll save some money. Uh, and they say that like 40, uh, 40, I'm sorry, 48% <laughs> of the people who don't have insurance will get a subsidy, get, you know, that grant money to help pay for that. And one of the important things I think about the having coverage is you don't pay, you know, for preventive services. So uh, like anybody, now you could get, you know, alcohol counseling. So, I mean, you have trouble drinking or something, that's free. That's a preventive ser a service. You know, aspirin use, you know, that, you can go get consultation for that. You see, if you should be doing that, you know, for your heart problem, high, hot blood pressure screening. This is all free stuff. They can't pay you, a, they can't charge you a copay or, or uh, co-insurance or any of those little tricky things They try to get more money from you. Cholesterol screening, free, you know, cancer screening, free depression screening man you don't think you oh man you're feeling lousy and you don't know why or whatever well you can go that and get that evaluated by an expert and do it for free diabetes screening do i have diabetes or not you know i'm not eating well i'm overweight whatever diet counseling you know don't go to some infomercial yeah and get some new quick fix diet thing Go to a professional, and because that is free, you get that coverage, and you're paying ten dollars a month, or even if it's a hundred dollars a month, what the heck? You have full coverage, HIV screening, all these obesity screening and counseling. You're worried about weight, you know, a tobacco use screening. How are you going to quit smoking tobacco again? Because that's a big problem. And then there's special preventive services just for women, you know, breast cancer, mammographies, you know. Uh, you know, breastfeeding support and counseling, you know, so you have a baby and you're worried about that. Cervical cancer screening, contraception, that's all free. No matter what they're arguing about on Capitol Hill about that, it is free. Uh, domestic and interpersonal violence screening and counseling. You know, you're in a relationship that you're thinking, you, you know, you, you, you're, uh, you know, there's violence involved. Well, you can get free counseling for that kind of thing. And look at it, it goes on and gar gonorrhea screening, HIV, you know, osteoporosis screening, 
uh, sexually transmitted degrees uh, infection counseling, you know, urinary tract in infection, and well woman visits. Right? <laughs> well woman, that's like keep you well. You go get a visit, you get a physical. See, physicals are free, you know, and you don't pay a nickel for that. And that's what's so neat about this. We have people, you know, now that have insurance. They come. We're, we're you know, the cost of insurance in this country is double most you know, uh, developed countries, and that's another issue. The important thing is that people who don't have it get it, because what we're happening, see, in this society, you know, we say, okay, you could show up in the emergency room and pay, and that's the most expensive thing in a country to do. So now we're getting, trying to get smart, so people who don't have it, you know, they do the last resort and show up in an emergency room, and we all pay that, and we're paying more for that for anything. And don't forget, you know, you could be making up to like $95,000 and still get a grant money to help you pay for, <laughs> for your health care. Wow! <laughs> I mean, uh, what a deal. You know, so there, there's that kind of help out there. You have to know about it and go to healthcare.gov. You know, that's the place. Healthcare.gov uh, and start the process there. You know, apply early, apply often, or whatever it takes. There's local help. You go on that site and they'll show you your local exchange and local numbers. Here's an 800 number if you need help, uh, even because you can't get on a web or something like that. 800 318 2596. 800 318 2596. Start the process. You already have coverage from last year. Go back, look at the programs again because there are people now going back. Hey, you know, I could save another 50, 100 bucks a month or whatever on that. Or if you're, uh, you know, your income has changed or whatever, make sure you get that in the system because. You know that maybe the government will pay more this year, than, you know, than they did last year. Give you an extra, you know, uh, fifty grand or two hundred thousand a year. I'm not two hundred thousand, twenty thousand. No, two thousand dollars a year. You know, to pay for the premium. So it's all there. It, it takes some effort, but it's learning a system. More and more things are going to be on the internet. Uh, that's the way life is going to live. And if you don't know now. Contact one of the local offices. You can walk in and they will help you. I've been through a lot of these offices. Very nice people. They're uh, trained in this. They sit down with you and go step by step. And the help is out there. So that's Obamacare, healthcare.gov. You know, the new economy now makes it possible for almost anyone to take almost any crazy idea you have and get money and customers on the internet all by yourself with hardly any money at all, you know, and to start your idea. See, the big guys, the big corporations and everything, they need zillions of consumers, you know, and they want to go make the stuff first and, you know, make thousands of copies of whatever product it is in China and ship it here and, you know, put them in Walmart and everything like that. But you don't have money to do that. And it doesn't matter anymore because you can go right on the internet and just sort of start yelling, hey, who wants to buy this little gizmo I'm thinking about making down in my basement? Yeah. <laughs> and then people start giving you money ahead of time. And when you get enough of that money, hey, now I have money to make it. Yeah. And that's what's so great about the internet nowadays and what's available to anybody. You know, you don't have to be a, uh, a computer genius to know all this. You know, they, they make it easy for you. You just have to, you know, try it. That's the thing in life is just trying it. Yeah, and then you do it. And, and to be independent, then you don't have to use the big guys to do anything. Man, because they need billions of customers. You know, with a 100 customers, 500 customers, 1,000 customers, for you in your basement, that's a big deal, you know? So you only make a million dollars, big deal, you know? <laughs> See, the big companies, they'll ignore that. That's what's so neat about the internet. We could have these unique things. I mean, the guy you're gonna hear, see in this interview, he made a soap dish that doesn't make your soap melt. Man, I didn't even know that was a problem, but it is because he's got hundreds and hundreds of people. He already got 15, 20 grand or something like that. You know, people give money ahead of time to make his soap dish. So, he, so it doesn't matter how big the market is, how, how small it is, there's enough people to finance your idea and you can find these people now on the internet. You don't have to go to a store, you don't have to have your product in a store or anything. No, the internet is bigger than any store around. So start learning how to use it. Watch this. 
Well, Keith Barclay, uh, and it's Crevere.com, and you're the guy who's going to save all those sloppy soap dishes we have in the kitchen and the shower and everything. Man, it's just an incredible idea. I mean, I, I, I'm just was sort of like, like cleaning my shower stall last week, and I'm looking where we put the soap. You know how it gets all mushy and all that junk there? And yeah, you know, we spent all this money on a nice shower, and the soap just looks like hell. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, and, and uh, you know, soap seed is perfect for the shower because it keeps your soap from sitting in that pool of slime. And yeah. your soap will last a lot longer. And the soap dish will look nice so you don't have this ugly soap saver <laughs> sitting there that still gets nasty. So, yeah, that's that's why I decided to come up with uh, with a really good soap dish that really worked. I mean, nobody likes to pick up a nasty bar soap. <laughs> and you're right, but it's something I would have never thought of. You know, but my God, I know it, it, it's something that wouldn't. But now that I see this, and what I, I love about it is that the whole container reflects the uh, porcelain or whatever, you know, the tiles in my shower curtain, my shower, you know, so it looks like custom made, you know, just for me, you know, I got a $20 thing that looked custom made by, by some artist. Yeah. That was uh, really one of the big things that I wanted to accomplish was a, uh, a, a soap dish that was high in design. So yeah. I really wanted to look really nice. What we accidentally kind of came up upon was the reflective surface really took on the entire base of the soap dish, made it look exactly like whatever it was sitting on. So it it really, and along with the colors of the trays that we made, it just makes it look so custom that uh, we decided just to offer that one color for now because it really, it's it's really the best color. It's it's a polished nickel that just takes on the look of whatever it's sitting on. So yeah. So that, it looks like, I mean, to me, when I first saw it, it looks like, you know, something as elegant like a, an iPad or something, you know, how elegant those things are. So this is like an iPad for your soap in the shower, you know, something very elegant that no one would think of spending that kind of money. And it's really not expensive. I mean, this is like 20, 30 bucks or something for this thing. And, right, I'm glad, I'm glad you noticed that yeah. because that was the biggest thing was trying to get that look. I mean, the, the hardest, I mean, when you look, go to the store and you look at, Soap savers and soap yeah. dishes are two different things. The soap savers are ugly, <laughs> but they might but they might protect your soap from melting yeah. so fast. And the soap dishes are beautiful, yeah. but your soap is going to melt. So right. to try and blend the two, the high design and the superior <laughs> function, that was the hardest thing. So um, when when this was done and it was created, uh, the the look of it to me, like again, it's it's a really nice, solid, uh, organic look to it. Yeah. Um, that and, and, it, and it works better than any soap saver that's out there now so yeah but, but it, it looks elegant i mean organic to me i think of some earth mama kind of stuff but this well is i guess in, in 3d modeling the organic <laughs> yeah, is the right exactly right it. yeah and, and and this looks uh you know elegant i never thought a soap dish could look elegant you know uh and it does so you have a piece of equipment that people will talk about when they come into your shower or actually it's it's, it's for the uh your kitchen or, or anywhere your bathroom yeah, so wherever, wherever you use bar soap i mean yeah. people use it in their tub so where do you put your soap in your tub i mean if you That's have right. a uh a cloth wick tub right a lot yeah. of my customers will have a uh you know in the construction industry have a freestanding tub there's nowhere to put your soap unless you get ah. these wire baskets that end up yeah. rusting this ah, will actually I adjust see. There's, there's back legs on it that adjust that will sit on that rounded edge of the tub. A soaking tub, a lot of people have the soaking right. tubs that are built into a deck. I, this sits on the edge without oh, sliding on. No, you got to see the, the video you know, you have is, is beautiful and it, it shows all that. You know, the lady yeah. in the bathtub and everything so you can see. God, so there's little legs on the back you can adjust and it fits on any, any uh, tub. Yeah. We had to make sure if we were uh, making the perfect soap dish that it could fit at your sink, at your I shower know. or your tub. We wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, it, you don't buy and say, oh, I can't I can't use it, you know. So and uh, you, a draining soap dish needs to fit just about anywhere. <laughs> and you're the guy to do this because you've been helping like fat cats put in bathrooms and kitchens for the most of your life, right? <laughs> That's right. So for over 20 years, I've been a builder remodeler. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I, you yeah. see the issues that uh, everybody has. has and, you know, yeah. It's funny including that, myself so. yeah. <laughs> yeah and then you said you, like, you really did this because this was a problem that you hated in your own house uh, 
Not That's so right. much. I don't. Few. I wasn't one to like the uh, the the liquid soap. Yeah. You know, washing my hands yeah, and face I, with liquid I, I soap. Know. You know, especially in construction, you have yeah. dirty hands, whatever. And you really want yeah. a bar soap. So, yeah. you it, naturally, I started thinking. <laughs> you know, what can I do to make this better? And this is what I came up with. <laughs> but actually, you're starting a little mini soap industry too. You have another product on your website. Uh, you know, the soap tainer, which is a big soap. container, right? That you That's put it when you have one of those squishy things that, that we have in our <laughs> kitchen here. <laughs> right. So a lot of people have built in soap dispensers in their yeah. kitchen. There's a tiny, tiny little bottle yeah. underneath it yeah. that needs to be filled every couple of weeks. Right. And then when you fill it, it overfills and makes right. a mess on your countertop. Yeah. <laughs> then you put the, the pump back in, right? And right. it overflows some more. <laughs> so you time. waste a ton of soap. And you're doing it every couple of weeks. So the soap container is a space-saving container that actually holds a gallon of liquid soap. A gallon, under but your it looks so thin. Gallon. You know, I mean, it's two again, inches wide. Yeah, it's yeah. elegant again. I don't know why you, something nobody's going to see, but it looks elegant anyway. <laughs> well, what's great about it is it's only two inches wide. Uh -huh. It uses the height and the depth of your cabinet to get I the see. gallon capacity. And you get a uh, gallon in that sucker, huh? A gallon. So you wow. buy a nine dollar gallon of soap instead of all these little, uh, you know, refills, right. and uh, you know you're saving money. You can go for six months to a year between refills. Wow. Plus, refilling is easy. It tilts yeah. out. Ah, and you can just dump that whole gallon in without a funnel. I see. And you can always see the level of your soap. So when you open your cabinet and you look, you can just see the level of the soap and you know, you'll just never run out because you'll refill it before it runs out. That's so, right. Otherwise, you can't see where that thing is unless you go, <laughs> nothing coming out. And you're banging the hell out of that thing. Right. right. Yeah, right when you need the soap, it's run out. Right. So, exactly. yeah. But I mean, it, what to me is neat is a problem like that. I, it's, a, it's an issue, but I never think about it or, or whatever. And here you spending a lot of time thinking the best way to do this, you know, for the rest well, of us. I mean, that's what's so nice about having you in our lives to, you know, to think about this stuff, because I'll never I'll just bitch about the soap <laughs> well it, it took me 20 years probably because i thought of it when i first you know got my own house and my own soap dispenser and i was waiting for someone to come out with it and nobody ever did so you know hey do you know, it yourself right it's america it way <laughs> and actually so, you're, you're thinking about maybe starting another line of business for yourself too with these kind ex of products yeah. exactly um mm -hmm. yeah so when you start thinking about products and uh -huh. what and, and ideas and things that you can create, you, I ended up just having a whole list of things. Yeah. So because of that, I knew that I wanted to keep creating products. So I figured I would start a brand and, uh -huh. you know, get, you know, slowly build products under the brand. And it's not the easy way to start, but it's, um, <laughs> It's, yeah, something. it's a way and, it's and then a something way. like your uh, crowdfunding on Kickstarter. I mean, that, that I mean, you said you did your own video even. I mean, I, were... I did my own video. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I've always been kind of a creative person. So yeah. I guess that kind of falls into it, yeah. you know, along with product development and, uh, you know, remodeling and construction. It's all like you got to use creativity. So <laughs> it's pouring out your heart, not only in, you know, uh, someone's new bathroom, but now in, in a soap dish. And when you see this soap dish, people haven't seen this. I mean, it's like two, three pieces to it. It's elegant. You put, you know, the, the, the squishy part in the dishwasher, you know, to, to wash it. You don't have to worry about it. And right. I so, just yeah, I, I, if I'm going to make something, I, li I like, I strive for perfection. So uh, no, I wanted to make sure every base was cut. I mean, you think a soap dish, it has to hold the soap. But no, you want it to be easy to clean. Yeah. You want it right. to, you know, actually not cause rust stains on your countertop. You want it to, you know, so... You know, you can just remove the top tray, right. throw it in the dishwasher, and you have a spare tray, put it in. You never have to clean your soap dish again. You know, the soap ah, stays dry, you know. So that's terrific. So thinking of all these things. <laughs> <I'm appropriate. laughs> well, I'm so glad you are because I, I would just bitch for the rest of my life. So now, <laughs> so, you, now you solve the problem for the rest of us and to find out. And actually, you're on Kickstarter now, so get it now because it's going to probably be more once you're off the campaign. Yeah, we're giving a really good deal to yeah, the Kickstarter backers. Kickstarter. That's the way you do it to uh, to get the you know the the funding goal so you, you right. want to give backers a really good deal and that's that's what we're doing right now yeah we have 10 days to go and you know yeah we'll get there and you can always get there and find the product later or or the other uh uh the soap tainer at uh Crevere. 
<laughs> dot com Creevere, k-r-e-v-a-r-e dot com now i went yeah. to college but i flunked english so i spell for everybody because well, i would <laughs> yeah it's a unique it's a unique uh, name yeah. and it's a combination well, of a few things yeah but it, it's sort of like revere i mean aren't there other you know uh, kitchen kind of things and revere wear so Crevere oh there you go so, yeah see <laughs> right exactly well wonderful keith nice to talk to you and that's Crevere k-r-e-v-a-r-e dot com Come. That's it. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a good one. Say goodbye to your wife back there. She's okay. very quiet. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Take care.